Hello YouTube, Mr. Gibson Guy here. Thank you for stopping by today. Uh, a new video. Today we are going to be looking at what we'll call it the, uh, the holy grail of photographers. The uh, most desired thing that we could come up with and uh, you'll be looking at today. And stick with me to the end because we're going to be looking also at some technology developed by one of the camera manufacturers in the 1950s that we still see and can apply from all the way back there to on today's modern digital cameras. So, we won't want to miss this. Thanks for coming by. First of all, <clears throat> that holy grail. I first started out in 35 millimeter photography in the early 1970s when I was in college. <clears throat> I didn't have a camera, but several of my roommates had cameras and they would let me use them from time to time. I got familiar with them and did some 35 millimeter photography and graduated from my Kodak Brownie days as a kid. Um, but I was on a pretty tight budget, so until I graduated and went out and started working. I started making some decent money. The first thing that I did was I bought myself a camera and then started a camera bag and some lenses and just I just went crazy for that. <clears throat> and it uh, I followed that for many many years and uh, I ended up with a bunch of stuff. I still have it and uh, I've been very pleasantly surprised to find out on YouTube that uh, even with all the digital stuff this, these days that there is now a, a lot of young people getting involved in photography. Uh, they're calling it analog photography, meaning film photography, not digital stuff, because they're finding out that uh, it's a different type of photography when you control it instead of these electronic whiz-bang things that you push the button and it does everything for you. So, um, kind of having a rebirth of what I call the golden age of photography, which was when I got into it. <clears throat> when I first started, the big thing, the big technology, was to have an actual light meter inside the camera, reading light through the lens. That was a, a big change from external light meters. It was just a new thing. And I followed photography through all of the developments of uh, electronics and automated ex and exposure times and, and programs and uh, motor winders and flashes and through the lens flashes and off the film plane flashes and all this technology right up till the late 80s when we got the Minolta Maxim and all of a sudden everything went into autofocus. Photography started to change. Uh, but uh, that 15 or so year period from 70s to early 70s to late 80s, uh, that was the heyday for me in photography and I was really involved in all that. And that's what I call the golden age. And I, th I think it kind of ended when, <clears throat> when we went to program the autofocus and the camera did all the thinking for the photographer and went from there. Uh, but there was, of course, the, that had to happen. We had to have progress and things were going to go. But uh, through all my experiences, uh, <clears throat> and photography was a big thing. Uh, one of the, the things that came about that a lot of times people don't mention is that the fact that there was a very big changeover in photography when they went to uh, plastic parts on plastic tops, top plates and bottom plates instead of brass, and uh, all electronics inside the cameras and sensors and, and uh, computer chips and all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and what that brought about was two things. One was that it brought all kinds of technology to consumer photography and all of these things that a few years earlier had been the big deal on 
a Nikon F or a Canon F1, the old one, the professional cameras that had motor winders and electronic flashes and through the lens meters. All of a sudden, all of this started showing up in consumer stuff, which the other thing was that because of the change in designs, cameras were much easier to build than the mechanical all gears and springs and wind up things that were in the old mechanical cameras. They were all like a fancy watch and very expensive to make. And then cameras started to streamline because they could use electronics to do all this complicated mechanical stuff with shutter speeds and everything. And so prices went down and in just a shoe few a shoe for a few short years uh, people on a budget could afford all the technology that just a few years before had been only the confines of the pros the people that bought really expensive cameras and lenses and zooms and all these all these different things that we could have we have wide angle to telephoto who would ever thought that that would have worked but they could do it and now, wide zoom ratios are common day, but and originally it's like, wow, this is amazing technology, optical technology, um, as well as electronics and mechanical and, and design. And the biggest thing I think was what Olympus did with miniaturization, making them smaller. Um, but <clears throat> one thing that Nikon first they big originators and everything, first experimented with and developed as a product that the other cameras companies didn't, but they had to follow suit once Nikon had done this, was they said, all right, well, we make professional stuff, so money is not really the object. And what they did was uh, they started making the lenses bigger and heavier and putting these great big cyclops eye front uh, elements on these things and they came out with the 300 millimeter f 2.8 telephoto lens now when they first came out with this there was already a Nikon f 4.5 300 millimeter this was one step and a third faster and it cost three times as much for that one and a third step and speed because of this but if you were a photographer and you were a pro and you were making your living off of it three times the price didn't mean anything you had to have this lens to get the shot and of course after this this when they when Nikon first came out this this was they pushed it on the market it was a two-piece lens and then they quickly came out with the uh, it was so popular everybody had to have it and nowadays if you watch a sporting event on TV or if you go to one or uh, concerts things uh, news cons conferences uh, uh, any sort of news coverage you're going to see photographers that have one of these on a tripod or a unipod with the camera attached to the back of it. And the, oh, those are the serious guys, they have this. And this became really the most desired piece of equipment to most photographers. They wanted to have this. Why would they need it? Well, this lens, they discovered, does some really amazing things. It's a very large aperture, f2.8, so it transmits a lot of light, which you need for longer lenses because you can't use real slow, slow shutter speeds. You gotta, you, you get a lot of shake in there, so you gotta try to get the shutter going fast, and that means a fast uh, lens, as much light transmission as you can get. Uh, that also gives you a razor small, sharp depth of field. You focus here. Something that's here or up here is just going to be a blur because you're just going to have a very narrow focus of field, uh, depth of field. And what you can do is that isolates your subject as to being in sharp, razor sharp focus 
while the background and the foreground are just a blur. So you really emphasize what you're taking your picture of because everything else disappears. And it, you learn to see through the viewfinder differently. Um, with one of these, you open up to f2.8 and you mostly leave it there because you want that effect. Uh, sure, you can see a long distance, but uh, this became the very early recognition as what a serious photographer is going to have. This right here. And that became my holy grail and started me on a 40 year uh, quest to get one. Uh, it wasn't going to happen, of course, for, a, for the foreseeable future when I started out in it. These things were crazy expensive. The camera was a couple hundred bucks. These were going for 1600 bucks if you could ever find one. And they were vanishing any time any of them showed up at the nicer photography shops. Because people had to have them. And other companies started to do it. They started out with Nikon and Canon followed and Pentax. Minolta was just about to, and then they came out with their Maxim, so they held off. And as soon as they came out with the Maxim, the first lens they had was the 302.8. Oh, nowadays in modern parlance, how you would say it is, it is the 300 millimeter f2.8 is now a 328. That's the shorthand way that they say it. So we'll refer to it as a 328, 302.8. That's what it's short for. You got that, though. Um, but the manufacturers started coming out with more of these lenses, all based on this one. They go 400 millimeter f4, and uh, 200 millimeter f2, and things like that. Great big front elements, as much light as possible, very shallow depth of field, and price is no object. And there was people that were willing to buy them, even though the lowering in prices on cameras and basic lenses uh, because of mass production and mass demand lowered significantly the price of photographic equipment. Still the top of the line stuff was really expensive. Um, and I stayed with that through the early years looking them up all the time. As soon as I get a camera magazine I turn to the back where the Adorama and the B&H and all those places are, where they were advertising Wall Street camera and stuff like that. And where's the 300 f 2.8? Okay, here we go. Wow, 16.95. Just not going down. And they stayed that way all through that time period, up through into the autofocus period. And uh, then what happened was the uh, all the guys who had during the the manual focus period who had bought their 328s then went to autofocus. They needed to get an autofocus 328. So they would trade in the 328 manual focus. And so they started showing up in the camera stores because these guys were trading them in to get an autofocus version, which of course the prices went up on. Uh, so there started to be some downward pressure on these. Um, they kept going. Um, there was three, well, let me get to that in a minute. Uh, what happened is then some other independent companies, Sigma, Asanuma Tokina, and Tamron, the individual, the lens companies that made lenses to go on other people's cameras, and they, they were just a glass factory, they just did melt lenses. They started coming out with 328s themselves, a little bit cheaper. And there was so much market that was, you know, oh, hey, I can get one of these for 1100 I, I could do that. I could live without the gold band on the Nikon ED. Extra low dispersion that they had, the ED lenses. Um, so with the uh, independent companies coming out with lenses, then the price started to go down some more and we started to see lower pressure on prices. And then when we got up to the new millennium, 2000, 2001, 
we started going, getting more serious as we could get more megapixels into digital photography. And film was starting to wane a little bit. People were looking at, hey, we can do more with digital. And of course, you know, 6 megapixels became 10 megapixels, became 12 megapixels, became 15, and pretty soon 28 megapixels and 30 megapixels. And it was just up from there. And real quickly, the need for film technically died out. And people were using these new digital cameras from a different format, and they needed lenses that went to them. So the autofocus 328, 328s and the on manual focus 328s, they became, uh, what do we call it, obsolete to the people using the latest stuff. And so the prices started getting really reasonable. And so I started checking up on KEH and stuff from time to time. Uh, I had a couple little point and shoot cameras, digital cameras. Huh. I got a Canon, look at that. See that? Viewfinder on the back. Never had a Canon, but. Uh, I got one electronically, and you plug it into your computer. But I was still a film guy and a 35 millimeter guy. That was it, and I kept my stuff. And so I went through the years, and the prices go down, and I check it from time to time. And then something happened a couple of weeks ago. I was looking for a cassette player, and uh, I went to a pawn shop. For the cassette player, looking around for cassette players, and I couldn't find any. I saw a camera bag, and I said, "Hey, show me what's in here." And what was in there was <laughs> an Olympus OM-1, and 50 millimeter lens, and three off-market lenses that were in OM mount for this. And it wasn't working. I said, "How much is it?" He says, "Well, it's it's for display only." He said, "It's uh, the camera doesn't work." I said, well, how much? He said, uh, 60 bucks. I said, I'll take it. And I took it home and I saw that it had a spring that was loose in the, under the base plate. Uh, watched a YouTube video and got a couple of screwdrivers and took it apart. Put the spring back in and lined up the gears correctly. And uh, then the next thing I did was I went on, on uh, KEH camera brokers and picked up a motor drive, the auto winder that goes goes with it, the Winder 1. Because I always loved this thing with the Winder 1 on it, this really cool little outfit that they had. And uh, so I, as well as all my Nikons that I've had for decades, I had a uh, Olympus, which I always admired, and I got one, 60 bucks and a little repair job. and. Uh, on uh, KEH, I was uh, I found <laughs> the Winder one starting at seven dollars for the ugly ones, but I got one in excellent condition and it was seventeen dollars. <laughs> These things were like a hundred dollars when they were new, so it's like oh I love it. Put it together and everything's working fine on it, and I once again have an OM camera. I had an OM OM two N years ago, but I traded it for motor drive, and I missed it. So now I have an OM one. And while I was on BNH, I just had to look up three two eights, and guess what I found? A Tamron three two eight. This is the uh, model uh, sixty B from the Tamron SP series. This was really high quality lens that supposedly was rivaling the regular photographers houses, the Nikons and the Canons. Uh, and I've uh, really longed to have this one especially uh, because of being a Tamron. Tamrons were the, the, the highest level uh, aftermarket lens, and lens house and they were known, that's, that's the big part here, for their Tamron Adaptol 2 lens mounts. What that means is this is not mounted to any brand of camera. You get 
an adapt all adapter with it to put it on whatever camera you want to use it for. This one here is for the OM. This other one here I got has the saddle on the top. See that? That of course is for a Nikon. So the OM mount, let me show you how easily this works. This is really cool. Alright, you first of all you set your lens to the largest aperture. See that? F2.8, that's what this lens is all about. That's where it's going to be. And you look around till you find a green dot. See the green dot there? And there's a green dot right here. And what you do is you line them up, green dot and green dot. This is sort of turquoise. Press and twist until it clicks. There, it's locked into place. Now, your Tamron 328 is an OM mount. So it will go on your OM camera. Or, that's one of the things when you get to the 328. With normal lens, you take your camera and you attach the lens to it. With this baby, you take your lens and you attach the camera to it. Line up the red dot to red dot, twist, and there. Notice I'm not holding the camera, I'm holding the lens. That's where it's balanced, it's right in the middle there. So, yes, usually you put a lens on a camera. In this case, you put a camera on a lens. And then, with that done, there we go. We have working camera. And we are in completely connected, all different f-stops automatically, and we're ready to go. So then, let me get this right. There we go. I did this wrong before I was practicing. Where I took the lens off of the adapter instead of taking the adapter off of the camera. That can happen. So red dot, red dot, back to normal. Now, for removal, you have a little button that you press here. And you twist this one. How did I do that? Oh, here. There. Off it comes. OM mount. Now, I'll take the Nikon F mount and I'm going to look for, oh, I can do it with glasses. I'm going to look for the blue dot like I did before. There's a blue dot. Come on, blue dot, show yourself. It's here somewhere. Here it is. It's hiding under this. Okay. Now, here we go. See the blue dot under my finger there? That's got to line up. Put the lens on F2.8. Line up blue dot with blue dot. Can you see that there? Do you see what I see? There, press, twist it, and we're all set. Now, we're in the little F2 weight is there and the big F2 weight is there. Now, once we get it on for Nikon, we've switched this to F5.6. I'll show you why. Here I have a Nikon FT, Nikormat. This was a camera of the 60s and early 70s. That was the uh, consumer version of the Nikon F. Doesn't have a removable pentaprism. Had a CDS meter built in, and it's basically like a Nikon F, except it's not a removable back. Uh, now, set on 5.6 with the saddle there. We line this up with this pin. 
which we have set lined up with that screw right there so that this goes on and we twist and now we are all indexed from the f-stop for the lens onto the camera and all right you hear that listen to that that's what the shutter sounded like in the 60s yeah that? that's cool isn't it thunk so that puts us on the Nikromat FN, which is a one of the originals, one of those very first mounts. They came out with this in the late 1950s. And yet here it is. We can put this Tamron on there. Or, let's see, line this back up with the screw. See how the pin is with that. Here. Twist. So we can use it with classic Nikons or about FM2. This is a cinch. Now we line it up on the white dot, red dot for Olympus. Twist. And we're all indexed right there because this is auto indexing. It works from this point instead of from that little saddle thing there, grabbing it. And press the button, twist, lens is disconnected. More modern. Just don't hang with me here because this is the good stuff here. All right, F3. It's a great camera. What a workhorse. This is this is a lens and camera combination that you're looking for. That's serious stuff there. And all connected and working out fine. And, and you read it out in the viewfinder too. Remove. Now, here's the moment we've been waiting for. This is the Nikon D5200. This is a digital camera. A mod I mean, this is, I guess this is a little bit the, not the latest model right now. They're, I don't know, D5500 or something like that, but this is a modern day digital cam Nikon. And it's got this basically the same F mount. Line up with the dot. Like that. And it's all completely connected. And it's working with this. So what we have is we have a lens, manual focus lens for film cameras that we can use all the way up through modern day digital cameras. Now, of course, the format is different on digital cameras. So this is a six power telephoto on a 35 millimeter. And it's about a, looks like about a 10 power. This is like 500 millimeters uh, when you put it on a, on a digital icon. Because I guess it's, a, I don't know what the mathematics is, but that's what happens with it. So now, I bought this one lens, oh, $376 plus tax, and uh, $12 for the OM mount, $14 for the Nikon. And I can use it on all those cameras. Uh, if I get a Canon someday, I can get a Canon mount, put it on there, or a Pentax, a Minolta. So you could use this for any lens that you have, as long as there's a uh, Tamron Adaptol 2 lens adapter for it, then you're all set. Now, the last thing I'm going to show you, I did this uh, yesterday. First got it's kind of cloudy and nasty out looking today cold, but we had a nice day yesterday, and so I went outside in the yard. I don't know if this is going to work here because of the glare. Let's see. 
Click pictures. Oh, these are digital, obviously, images taken with the Tamron 328. Yeah, if you can see this, you can get really good detail on the foreground on this plant. And then the other stuff is all out of focus on it. But this is really in focus. So I don't know how good it is video camera from a computer screen, but uh, I'll show you that there's the image is high. You can see me here. All right. Well, thank you for watching. Give, give, give me a like if you like this and stop by again and see new stuff because uh, you can find your holy grail and it might be a real bargain these days because of obsolescence. I'll see you next time. This is Mr. Gibson Guy out.